Christmas, the fifth Sunday of Easter, is found in the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey, and reptiles, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times. And all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me. And we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who was I that I should stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, God. Grace and mercy and peace to each one of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. My text today is the passage from Acts chapter 11 that Pastor Lynn read earlier. How many of you have ever been on a diet? I have been on lots of them. When I was in the Navy, they would weigh us twice a year. They had, I, I had to come in at a certain weight. So for three months, I would gain weight, and then for three months, I would die and lose weight so that the next weigh-in, I would be able to fit. And then it went up and down, up and down. Like I did that for, for years. Probably not a good thing to, to do. And some of you maybe remember when I first came here about two years ago, do you recall? Uh, I, I, I've never had problems eating anything. I could eat whatever I wanted my whole life. But something happened where I developed allergies, and so I was broke. My whole body was broken out. I came to church and I was suffering, and I said, "I'm just going to preach the sermon, and somebody else has to do all the rest." And as soon as this church was over, my daughters took me to the hospital. Turns out I had these allergies. Right? They said, "Oh, you're allergic to nuts, and you're allergic to wheat. So now I have to watch out. I can't eat any of those things." Or maybe you know somebody that has to eat gluten free or somebody that's on a low carb diet or somebody that's on a vegan diet or maybe you've met somebody that eats kosher ah because kosher is a special kind of diet isn't it and there are different kinds of kosher there are different levels i should say of eating kosher certain things you all know that if you eat kosher you can't eat right and bacon pork chops, crab, and lobster, cheeseburgers. Oh boy, that would be hard for me to live kosher. It would be hard. 
I respect the people that do it. I don't know if I can do it. And then if you are living kosher at some of the higher levels, you have to be careful how it's prepared. All the dishes, dishes can only be used for one thing. You can't just wash them and then use them for something else. Who slaughters the animal and how it's done, that all fits into that. Well, why do people who eat kosher, why do they go through all of that? Why do they do it? Well, it was in the Bible, wasn't it? Mostly out of Leviticus chapter 11. The idea that God said, this is how I want you to eat. This is what you can eat. This is what you can't eat. Well, why? Why did God restrict the things that they could eat or couldn't eat? There have been lots of justifications put forward by, about this through the years. One of the things eating kosher does is it, it separates you from the Gentiles. You eat kosher, so you're different from everybody else. It's a form of religious discipline. If you eat kosher, you're living a certain way. There's a hygiene dimension to it. I had a pastor tell me years ago, I don't know if he was right, but he said, think about eating pork 3,000 3, years ago or 4,000 years ago. They didn't have the way, they didn't have the knowledge we have about um, diseases and things like that. Uh, some people say it's a humane care of animals, how the animal would be slaughtered. Some people have suggested it has to do with restraining our instincts because the scripture says there that eating this way would afflict our souls. So you had, you're learning by the way you eat to, to not just give in to anything and everything that you want. Uh, those are all good ideas about kosher. I don't know exactly which one is the right one or which, maybe they're all a little bit right. But here's something that the book of Leviticus tells us itself. From chapter 11, he says, Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them, that's these unclean animals, and or be made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. There, do you see it repeated twice in the same scripture about clean and unclean? About being holy? That's what it was given for. So what does eating, how, does the, the, how do the things that you eat, how do, what does that have to do with being holy? Well, before we explore that, it's useful to understand just kind of in general how the law works. You know, God didn't tell us everything at once. There's something we call progressive revelation, meaning that over the course of history, over time, God progressively revealed more and more. He told us more things as we went through it, leading up to the fullness of his revelation, which was in Jesus Christ, of course. And so Paul describes a little bit of how the law functions in this larger scheme of progressive, unfolding revelation. In Galatians chapter 3, he said, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned under the coming, until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So Paul explains how it functioned. The law, the Old Testament laws, served as a guardian for us until the coming of Christ. The King James Version translates that same word as the schoolmaster. Have you ever heard it described that way? The law was our schoolmaster until the coming of Christ. The Greek word there, uh, i got to make sure I pronounce this with the accent in the right place. Pedagogos. Pedagogos. It's where we get our English word pedagogy. It was to teach us the way you would teach a little child so that we would learn. Now there's a lot to say about the things that we learn from the law and all that we needed to learn prior to coming to faith in Christ. But what do we learn here in particular, especially from kosher foods? Well, the biggest thing that we learn is the distinction between clean and unclean, between holy and defiled. 
We have to get in our heads these concepts of what is clean and unclean, holy and defiled. And so they're introduced to the people physically, in a practical way, by what you eat. Take, for example, leprosy. We know that in the Old Testament, someone who had leprosy was unclean. You've all seen the movies, right? Somebody comes near a leper and they hold their shirt up and say, unclean, unclean, no one will touch them. But now if you would meet a leper, what would you do? Would you say, oh, unclean? No, with compassion, you would care for her. You would try to, try to help her with her, her needs, right? So the rule in the Old Testament served its purpose by teaching people this concept that there is clean and unclean. There's what's right and there's what's wrong. And a lot of those kind, those, uh, those particulars then don't have any durative value in the New Testament. We no longer tell lepers to go away as though they're unclean. The kosher laws work the same way. So I hope you were listening when Pastor Lynn read from Acts chapter 11. Peter is reminding or remembering his vision that he had in Acts chapter 10, a vision in which the Lord lowered down a sheet filled with all kinds of unclean animals, told him to eat them. And Peter said, no, I don't. I eat kosher, Lord. I don't eat unclean animals. And God said, don't call unclean what God has called clean. The three times this vision happens. And then Peter goes with these men to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, in the town of Caesarea, and there he explains to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, it would be worth your time when you get home after lunch to go back and read Acts chapter 10. He explains how Jesus Christ was chosen by God, how Jesus died on the cross, how Jesus was raised to life and was seen after his resurrection by witnesses God had chosen, and how Jesus would be the judge of all, and how anyone who believes in him would have forgiveness of sins. And guess what? They believed. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it fell upon the apostles at Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, this is huge. You see, this shows that holiness now was not restricted just to the Jews. Holiness belongs through the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ to everybody, even Gentiles. That's why all of us here today, most of whom I assume are Gentiles, that is why we can be God's people too. Now through Jesus and because of Jesus, those kosher laws don't apply anymore. You don't have to eat kosher diet. It has served its purpose. It's like the sacrifices in the Old Testament. We don't do sacrifices of animals up here at our altar. Why? because they pointed toward Jesus. But now that Jesus, the true sacrifice, has been offered, those old ones are fulfilled. They're completed. Their, their pedagogical function has now been met. And most of all, this means that you can belong to Jesus too. You don't have to be Jewish first to be a Christian. Thank God for that. Thank God for it next time you're having bacon and eggs for breakfast. But the really big thing of this is that your sins, which would have made you unclean, your corrupted desires, which rendered you unholy, now in Jesus, those are erased. They are forgiven. He says, to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. You have that life. And you know what that means, right? We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about spiritual life. We're talking about abundant life in Christ. That's what you have now. Now, I can't close this sermon without making another important point about this. Is everything in the law fulfilled? Or has everything in the Old Testament law now been dismissed in such a way that we don't have to concern ourselves with it? And the answer, of course, is no. What about the Ten Commandments? Now, in Christ, we are no longer under the law. The Ten Commandments don't determine our destiny, but they still apply. We still use them. We still teach them. We still expect people to, to follow them, right? And Jesus made it clear that this is the case. If I could paraphrase him, maybe I could say it this way. Eating bacon isn't what makes you unclean, but slandering your neighbor does. 
Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, What goes into a man's mouth does not defile him, but what comes out of a man's mouth is what defiles him. So the kosher laws are completed in their purpose. You don't have to eat kosher anymore. You don't want to. But the moral component of those Old Testament laws, that's still in force. I was at the, conference, the uh, district pastor's conference this week, and somebody spoke to us about something called the Equality Act. And later in the week, then Dr. Willie, the president of the district, sent a, an email to all of the, the pastors encouraging us to contact, contact our legislators about this Equality Act. Now, Dr. Willie is not one to get involved in politics. In my two and a half years here, I don't think he's ever done this before. I think they're especially concerned about how this is going to affect uh, Lutheran schools. And part of the problem is the concern that this equality, equality especially for transgender people, is going to result in uh, accusations of discrimination against them by schools or churches. What is happening in our country? We're all against discrimination, of course. But in the name of discrimination, can our religious liberties and what we teach and what we believe be overruled? What's happening in our country here? So I wrote to our legislators that House of Representatives still passed the, the, the bill, so we'll see where it goes. Even when you understand the role of kosher laws and how they grant us the ability to distinguish now what is clean and unclean, have you ever asked yourself why certain animals were chosen to be unclean? This can be instructive for this current debate over transgender. I'm not sure that I know, but the best explanation I have ever read came from a British anthropologist. I know I saved that article, but when I was preparing my sermon, I couldn't find it, so I, I wish I could tell you her name. But she was explaining that she thought it had to do with the importance in the Old Testament of kinds. The Old Testament talks all about kinds. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, when God creates, he creates plants according to their kinds. He creates trees according to their kinds. Creatures of the sea, according to their kinds. Winged birds, according to their kinds. Livestock, according to their kinds. Things that creep along the ground, according to their kinds. And so she proposed that this idea of non-kosher foods comes from the fact that certain types of animals uh, give us the appearance of crossing over and being of more than one kind. For example, a walleye, that's kosher. You can eat a walleye. It's a fish, it's got fins, it's got scales, but you can't eat crab. Why is crab not kosher? Because crabs go in the water like fish, but crabs can walk out of the water like a creeping thing. It, it, it seems to mingle this idea of kinds. Pigs, why would pigs not be kosher? Because the pigs root in the, in the mud, their faces always digging in the dirt like a creeping, like a creeping thing. Now that's a very interesting theory to me. And we do see this idea in the Old Testament especially where God is concerned about mixing things together that are supposed to be kept separate. For example, in the Old Testament, you could not plant two kinds of seed in one field. You couldn't wear a shirt made from two different kinds of materials. And so we see also in the Old Testament God creating male and female. And so it's a sin in the Old Testament for a male to wear a female's clothes. Did you know that? What's behind all that? It's the mixing of kinds. And so this question arises. Would transgender, this idea of not sticking to male and female according to their kinds, would that be more like let's say the Eighth Commandment, which is still in force and still binding on us? Or would it be more like bacon, something that was a rule in the Old Testament to teach us something, but it doesn't really apply anymore? How would we know? Well, we know when we look at the New Testament and we see which laws, which kinds of laws, still have force. 
And so you could look in the New Testament at what God has to say about men and women. How men and women should act. What God wants men and women to be like. I'm not even going to tell you all the passages. I don't have time here to do it. But that would be a good study for you. I think you would enjoy it. You know, one feels deep sympathy pastorally when you talk to an individual, and maybe you've met people like this or have someone like this in your family. Maybe there's someone in the congregation that's like this. People who don't feel comfortable in their own bodies. Something just seems wrong to them. Well, that fact is a symptom of our fallen humanity. And one feels sympathy for them, but the answer is not to encourage them to question it further or to change it. Sexuality and sexual identity, we may have predispositions, but they are not fixed. They are fungible. They can and they do change in everybody. And they're affected by environmental, experiential, and volitional factors and very complex formulas for each person. So when society is encouraging our children to question who they are, are you really a boy or are you a girl in a boy's body? Or are you really a girl or are you a, 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 a boy in a girl's body? When we encourage them to question that, we should expect that more and more people are going to identify themselves as a different kind than what they are. So we continue. Not just to hold out eternal life through Jesus Christ, but we continue also with the gospel to preach the law of God. His durative, unyielding commands which cannot be thwarted. We hold these out to a society that is quickly losing its way. Where's our society going to go, folks? I don't know. But whatever happens, this I promise you. No one can take your joy from you. That's what Jesus promised in our gospel text today from John. You can surrender it if you want to, but no one can take your joy from you. And whatever happens, you have a home in the holy city of the new Jerusalem, where God will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and death will be no more, and there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. You don't have to live there. No one can take that away from you. You have the promise that the spirit of truth guides you through the scriptures, through the words of the apostles and the prophets, into all truth concerning Jesus. You don't have to listen to it, but no one can take that away from you. We have the promise that because Jesus lives, the victory is won. Amen. Would you please rise now and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came out from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made in him, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And is sent into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and that I need in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. O Lord, you have promised to be our God, and we rejoice to be able to be your children by grace. We ask now that you would hear our prayers, and the prayers of all your people, 
for all manner conditions of human beings. Lord, your church is set among many and great enemies. And yet you promised that no enemy would triumph over us. So we ask that you would give us confidence in your promise, that you would protect us and keep us from fear, that you would give us courage, that you would help us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give to our leaders in our nation, give them a sense of the accountability for the responsibilities they have. Help them to do what is right in your eyes. Help them, O oh Lord, to protect life, to stand for righteousness. Raise up men and women who have heroic virtue. Help them to defend our liberties. We pray for your protection over our armed forces, for all of our first responders, fire, police, medical. We ask that you would care for them and help them to do their jobs well and safely. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry you have given us here at Hope Lutheran Church and the charge you have given in the Great Commission that we make disciples of all nations. Grant that you would direct us, Lord, and guide us to do this well and faithfully. We thank you, Lord, for the women of Hope as they celebrate their last uh, formal day together this, this week. We pray, Lord, that you would bless their work and their service and all the good things that they do to help others. We thank you, Lord, for Jan, the director of our children's Sunday school, for the faithfulness and for the, the passion and care she has poured into taking care of our children and helping them to learn the Holy Scriptures. We pray for all of our children, and we ask that you would keep them, Lord, in your holy word, that the messages they may hear from our fallen society, our broken world, will not speak louder to their hearts than the messages from your word and the truth and the love that comes from Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would restrain us in the works of the flesh, the things that Paul tells us in Galatians are plain. Help us not to live this way or do these things, but instead grow in our lives and in our corporate life together as a church the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we would see ourselves experiencing what it is as we are transformed more and more into the nature of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, you are above all things, the Alpha and the Omega, and yet you have chosen to dwell among us. Give us continuously a greater glimpse of your glory. Help us to know what is good and right and true. Grant to us the, the perfect beauty of your presence. We especially pray for your presence in a, in a marvelous and wondrous way to be with those who need it most right now, those who are afflicted in the trials of this life. For all those, Lord, who suffer from stress, for all those, Lord, who have been afflicted with problems in their families, with struggles and trials in marriages or with prodigal children, these and all others that we name to you in our hearts, grant to them to see afresh the vision of the coming of the holy city and the new Jerusalem and the promise that every tear will be wiped from our eyes. Do miraculous and wondrous things in our midst, but do them in such a way that they redirect our gaze to the promise when all of this life and its sorrows will one, be lift, one day be lifted away and we will enjoy your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, you promised that our sorrows would turn into joy and that we would not long remember the anguish of our labor. And so it was for the disciples when you, your son was taken from them and he was crucified. And oh, we see their joy when they saw that he had risen from the dead. As we hear afresh the story of Christ's resurrection, as we partake of his body and blood and become one, with him. So we ask, O oh God, that our joy would be full. Give us confidence and grant us to see in all things how you are loving, merciful, and do everything for our final and ultimate benefit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. 